we've already done. I not, we've done more than that. Just a quick recap. Uh, we talk about product rule. Product rule applies when I have independent choices and all choices go to all other choices. Every combination is valid. The, the tra traditional example I always use is that three hats, four jackets, four pants. How many ways to dress up? Three times, four times, four. The inclusion exclusion principle is for counting a union. If it has these joint sets, it's very simple. You just count each set separately. Sometimes we refer to this either as sum rule or as cases. You know, when we said this problem has three cases. All the possibilities that are in A, that's one case. All possibilities that are in B, and all possibilities that are in C. Like, 
say all the students came from three continents, either North or four continents, North America, South America, Europe, and Asia. So now because no student can come from two continents at the same time, means I have no intersection, right? Everybody came either from North America or South America or Europe or Asia. Then if I want to count all the students I have in the class, how can I do that? This way. I count first the ones that came from North America, then I count the ones that came from South America, then the ones that came from Europe, then the ones that came from Asia, right? The sum rule applies when I want to count a union and I split it into cases that are disjoint. I know for sure no one came from two places. In the general case, sets are not disjoint. So I can still sum up all the counts, but then I have to take down the intersections of two, then I take down too many, I add back the intersection of three, and if I have four sets, I'll take down how many intersections of two I have? Six, right? And then I have to add all the intersections of three, which are how many? Four, and then I have to subtract all the intersections of four. What if I have five sets? I still add each separately, then I take down intersections of two, add back intersections of three, subtract intersections of four, and add the intersection of five. Right? So that's inclusion exclusion principle in general. It works with however many sets you have. So that's the, uh, the, the, the second principle. We have product rule for independent choices. We have inclusion exclusion or the sum rule for unions. This is of course very easy, but you must ensure these joint cases or sets. That works great if you can ensure that you split your problem into that and that the three categories of say passwords or students that are not intersecting. And we also talked about pigeon, that's a number three, pigeon hall principle. Now, everybody heard of the birds in cages and how many birds go in each case. I don't like that one for myself. I don't use it but it's totally valid principle. I already mentioned this at recitation. So I'm gonna state the pigeonhole principle the way I use it, and I'm not gonna, I'm gonna tell you that if you wanna use the traditional one with birds and cages, that's totally fine. Here's my version of it. If I have x1, x2, xn, bunch of values, and I wanna take their average, so these are values, could be real numbers. The average, everybody knows what an average is, right? How do I compute an average? <coughs> Sum them up. X1 plus X2 plus, plus Xn minus 1 plus Xn, right? And divide by N. Suppose that value is some, I'm going to call this average X bar. Sometimes called mu, sometimes called the expected value from statistics, the arithmetic average. If I have that average, here's my version of the principle. At least one of them, say xi, one of those, is greater than that <coughs> average. And at least one, say another one, xj, is smaller than that average you look at it this way, I think it's a pretty obvious principle. If you average a bunch of things and you get 97.31, out of the things you average, one has to be at most 97.31 and one has to be at least 97.31. How do we prove this thing? I'm not gonna do the proof exercise. But I want to give you the idea, I'm sure it's obvious. The proof is the alternative is impossible. What would be the alternative of this? Meaning if this doesn't happen, if I don't have a value, at least the average, what's the alternative of that? All values are less than the average. So how do I prove that's impossible? If all values are less than the average, how do I get the contradiction? The average 
why it's not possible all values being average being less than the average. Yes. By definition of what the <coughs> average is, it's like if all of them are smaller than x bar, the sum divided by n will be smaller than like it's less than x bar, less than x bar, less than x bar. The sum is less than n x bars divided by n, it will be less than x bar. Again, if this not true, it means all values are strictly smaller than x bar, the average, then their sum will be smaller than n x bars. And when I divide by n, that's going to be smaller than x bar contradiction. Who's with me? Do you think you can go home and write this proof? What about the other one? The alternative of this one is impossible in a symmetric way, just the other side. If this is not true, all values are strictly bigger than <coughs> the other, then their sum will be bigger than, if each one of them is bigger than x bar, what happened to their sum? Bigger than n x bars. When I divide by n, bigger than x bar, that's impossible. So I really mean it, after the lecture today, take five minutes, leave some space in your notes there, and write down these two lines of proof. This proof by contradiction, pretty simple. Now, I think this is a much more powerful pigeonhole principle than the one in the book. Uh, also more obvious to me, okay, in the way it's stated. So the only thing to relate the two principles, the one in the book with the one in class, is to say, if I tell you there are, what was the problem recitation? 300 <coughs> calls going to 80 students. Or if I have 300 pigeons going to 80 boxes. Which numbers I'm talking about here? This x1, x2, xn. What numbers are those in relation to pigeons and boxes? How do I move from one principle to the other? Because it's the same effect. So, if I say, I have 300 pigeons and I put them in 80 boxes, the pigeon principle said blah, 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 blah. Okay. Which ones are the x1, x2, xn in there? Yes. Um, n would be 80 for the 80 boxes. Right. And then each x represents how many pigeons are in that respective box. Right. This would be the distribution, the count of how many pigeons gone, got into each box. Which I don't know, of course, right? When somebody says you put 300 pigeons into 80 boxes, it doesn't tell you exactly which number of pigeons got into which box. Some of them might be zero, some of them might be five, some of them might be seven, fine. But there is a number that we don't know. So if we call x1, xi in here to make the relation, is the number of pigeons in box or cage i. That's called a distribution. It's how those counts, how those pigeons got distributed into the boxes. Right? So now, how does this principle work in relation to the one, the traditional principle of pigs with birds and cages? The sum of those counts got to be what? 300, right? I know there's 300 pigeons, so if I sum up the box 1 plus box 2 plus box 3, I get to 300, right? And n is? 80, the number of boxes. Now if I take that average 300 by 80, what do I get? Exact, this is an exact value. 3.75. So what is my theorem says here? One of those boxes must contain at least 3.75 pigeons, and one of the boxes must contain at most 3.75 pigeons. Now of course, if I know Say, as a separate thing, if x, i are integers, in many problems, those counts of pigeons into boxes are integers. If I took of, you know, ages of students or all kinds of problems like this that involve counting, typically x, i are integers. But this theorem doesn't need x to be integers. It works with any x real values. Now, if they are integers, what does it mean x, i bigger than x? This is almost certainly a real value, right? Like 3.75. So I can use the fact that they're integers and say, if it's bigger than this, it's got to be at least the next integer, right? Like if it's 3.75, it's got to be at least 4. So how do I write 4 in relation with this? There's a sign there, right? It's called what? Ceiling. Ceiling, and it's like that, right? 
x bar that's the ceiling is the next integer up and the other one xj is smaller than I get 3.75 it can't be 3 point anything because it's an integer so it's the floor. floor so that is the one the ceiling ceiling and floor you don't have to be worried if you never heard of this stuff it's just the integer up integer down simple and that's the case if you know the x's are integers like pigeons into boxes you don't want to chop the pigeons in half right so they go in integer values it counts into those boxes see the students into recitations no half student will go to recitation number three so there'll be an integer count again if you want to use the one with birds in cages that's totally fine it's just you get only one half the one that the way that's listed it's only the top they don't give you the bottom I don't know why they don't put this bottom one in there All right. so uh, let's do quickly one or two examples let's see uh, how this all this counting work now that's what we already done one two three so just as a preview what else is there what we need to do today um, uh, maybe right here today we have to do combinations permutations binomial theorem <coughs> with proof um, then we have to do balls into beans that's a particular type of counting we get to that probably Tuesday and finally in this counting module we gotta go back to the inclusion exclusion principle and prove that one we can't prove inclusion exclusion until we get to combinations and binomial theorem and if we're lucky and the other sections are slow we got to go to a different counting altogether, which has to do with the catalog numbers. That's, of course, an optional thing. That's today, and that's tomorrow. Tuesday. Not tomorrow. Tomorrow's Saturday, right? Tomorrow's homework day. <laughs> All right. So let me show you a few examples of basic counting before I go into combinations. Um, I'm going to try to do quick. Uh, I have um, 20 courses, <coughs> half math. Uh, I have 30 courses, half um, uh, programming. And I have 15 with both. How many courses? What type of counting is this? What is the question asking me to compute? Which method do I use? I know, you guys want to talk all the time, which is great, but I want to give other people a chance. Does it look like a product rule, an inclusion exclusion, or a pigeonhole principle? Yes, an inclusion exclusion. It looks like an inclusion exclusion, right? Because it asks me to compute effectively a what? A union size. How many courses are together is the union of the math and programming courses, except some of them are together, right? So how do I do that? The number of courses is the, the one with math, I'm gonna write this informally, plus the ones with programming, minus the intersection, right? I apply inclusion exclusion principle with two sets. So this is the ones that have math intersect programming. So what do I get? 20 plus 30 minus 16, <coughs> how much is that? 35. This could be a quiz question, perhaps the easiest quiz, quiz question. <laughs> it doesn't need five minutes, right? I mean, this takes 30 seconds. But you could expect the easiest quiz question to be something like that. You still will need to identify which method to use. Should be easy, but yes. You mean for the recitation? For the recitation, please. 
it won't be an exam question, I don't think, or a homework question, because homeworks are more involved than that. Um, how about another example? <coughs> I have um, two uppercase initials. Mine would be Virgil Pop, right? If it's me. And then I say, how many initials contain Z? What kind of problem is this one? I want all the possible sets of initials, like VP, assuming everybody has exactly two, that have Z, the letter Z in them. How many options are with Z? So I'm assuming there's 26 letters, 26 upper letters. <coughs> How do I know? Yes. Perfect. How many? 51 possibilities that include this. How did you do that? Which which kind of which one is it? Or how did you do it? Inclusion, inclusion. Another inclusion exclusion of two sets. What are the two sets here? One's with Z in the first, one Z in the second, and right. well, So I'm going to call them the sets Z anything. In computer science, usually when you say anything, we put a star. That comes from the Unix operating system. When you say all the files that starts with ABC, you say ABC star. So then we have this notation star, Z anything. So this is the set of starts with Z. <coughs> plus the set of everything Z, that's the ones that have the second letter being Z. Problem here is, what? Yes? They do not disjoint sets. So how many things are in the intersection? One, that is the set of what? There's only one, so it's a set of Z, Z. Right? That one has been counted twice. Now, when you write down in exam or homework, you have to be careful about this, because some picky TAs will, if you just say ZZ without the curly bracket, say, hey, if you put it this way, they will tell you that's not a correct notation. You're supposed to have a set here, but you only have an element. Uh, or if you put without the sizes, you put this way. Now you have the set, but this calls for arithmetics on sizes. So if I would be the grader, I wouldn't take points for something like this, but they do. So I would say do it properly. The set of ZZ, one element, size of it, of course, that's one. So what do we get? How many things are in the first set? Z anything. 26 plus 26 minus 1. That's how I got 51. Right. Easy stuff, right? Not too bad. Let's do another one. How about the initials? Three uppercase. <coughs> As in B, A, B, I. Better, better B, I. I don't have an initial, so if somebody says choose a middle initial, I'm going to choose I. <laughs> My username in the computer science department is VIP at. Because <coughs> they told me you got to have a third initial. I said, I don't have one. So they choose one. All right, I choose one. <laughs> some people have it, some people don't. Let's assume everybody has it for this problem. Now, how many with Z? How many of these three letters initials contain Z? We apply the same principle, of course. So what do we get? The sizes that have Z in the first position, that Z star star, that's the set of, I'm calling it informally, the all initials that start with Z, plus star Z star, that's all the initials that have Z in the middle, plus there's three sets here, star star Z, that's all the initials that end with Z. Now, of course I have intersections, right? So what's the intersections of the first two sets? I have to subtract intersection and two of two, and then add back the intersection of Three, right? Go back to the principle. 
we have the three sets. Now, of course, they don't, they overlap, so I can't just leave it like that. I have to subtract the intersections of two, put back the intersection of three. So how does that work? What's the intersection of two between those two? Which sets of initials contain Z here and Z in the middle? How does that look? Z, Z star minus now the other ones, Z star Z minus star Z, Z. And then I have to put back the intersections of three, which is Z, 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 right? Z, Z, Z. Now, because I'm not graded, I can skip the brackets and curves, and that's okay. <laughs> but you are. How many things con Z star star? How many things are in here? Z star star. We need a count. We don't need to enumerate them, just how many? Star star. How do I do that? What kind of counting principle can I apply to say the first initial is a Z, but I need the other two can be anything? Somebody else. Product. Product group? All right. So how many things I get? 26 squared. The same thing applies here. 26 squared. 26 squared. Now, in terms of subtraction, how many things I have here? Z, Z, anything. 26, 26, 26, 26, and then I have to put back one. Uh, I don't want to do that calculation. Apparently, it's 1951. Who knows if that's correct? Because the other instructor might have computed in class. People make mistakes all the time. I don't know. Does it look like 100, 900, 1,951 to you? Maybe. Any, in any case, in counting problems, this is not important. In most problems, you don't even have to compute it unless the problem clearly specifies we want the value. This is important. It's actually better for an answer because in here I can tell how you think about this problem, right? I could tell you were thinking this way. If you just give me this value back, I have no clue how you got there. Okay. Um, so we've got to these problems. Um, so let's do one more. Right? Suppose I have um, 250 students with two upper letter initials. Question is, uh, is it guaranteed to have two students, same initials? Can I apply the pigeon principle somehow and say here, if everybody has two initials and you have 250 students, you got to have somebody with the same initials. Is that true or false? Why is false? The number of possibilities with two initials is one. Hmm? Is it 51? Why is not 51? Yes. Because the choices are independent from each other, so wouldn't it be like a product rule? So what's the okay, so what's the difference between that and this? Why is this yes? You're not asking for the number of initials, but things you're just asking for the total number of pairs. So these ones here are only the ones that have Z in them. Right? These ones here are all of them. So they, they apply the product rule, I get twenty six square. How much is that? Six seventy six. C76, that's <coughs> bigger than 250, so no guarantee. How about if I have 1,000 students, 2,000 students? How many of them are guaranteed to have the same exact initials? Yes. Three. So how do I do that? The number, minimum number of students the same initials, it's got to be at least the ceiling, right, of who? Which ones are the pigeons and which ones are the boxes here? 
I have 2,000 pigeons, and they all go to the, everybody has initials, divide by 676, how much is this? Is it two point something or three point something? <coughs> 2.9 or is it because that's important, right? 2.9 is just three. Yeah, because that that's easy to see. The hard part is to get the exact value so we don't get confused whether it's so. This is less than three, right? That's the point. So this is then three, not four. Okay. So, hands up who's with me so far, simple things. Uh, it's not hard to solve them, but sometimes it's hard to know which way that goes. Is this a pigeon thing? Is it the product rule? Is it the sum rule? <coughs> which way do I go about it? I would say if you're not sure, try the problem a little bit in terms of common sense logic to see why you can't just compute those numbers without any method. And then that will tell you, depending how you get stuck, what kind of method to use. Right. So now we need to move on into more counting, which is combinations and permutations. To do so, the first thing we need to establish is what is the difference between a set and a sequence. So here's a set versus here's a sequence. Now, there's other names for this stuff, things like collection, or bunch, <coughs> or uh, pile. You can see those names. And there's other names for sequences. Some are particular, like pair. That's obviously a sequence of two things. Triplet, nplet. There's some other names that they all mean the same thing. It's a sequence. Now the main culprit between the two is that this one is no order. And this one is with order or in order. So very, very often for the problems that you're going to have to distinguish which one is it, it has to do with order. Now even the word order can be written as ranking or who knows some other term that involves order matters versus order doesn't matter. Sets, they're out of order, sequences are in order. So if I have a set A, B, C, D, of four things, that corresponds to several sequences. Right? You can think of a sequence as a set with order. Now that's not very mathematical, but in computer science, those fine. Set with an order means a sequence. So I can take a set, impose an order on it, and get a sequence. Can there be repeated elements in sequences? We'll get there. Yes, they can. But for now, we want to establish how sets relate to sequences. Okay. So when we get to balls into beans, that's going to come into play. For now, let's just say I take a set and I want to put an order to it. <coughs> so I could say, for example, of course, it could be A, B, C, D. Or it could be A, C, B, D. Or it could be B, A, D, C, so on and so forth, right? This is the same elements like the set, but they are in different orders. So this relationship from a set to sequences is not a one-to-one -one relationship. It's a one-to. This way, every sequence, I can immediately make it into a set in a unique way. The other way, I need an order. It's not enough if you give me a set to put it in order. Now, there might be a default order sometimes. If you don't say anything, maybe I list it alphabetically, or maybe from the smallest to biggest. But that's still a default order. So I need an order to create a sequence. Um, what if I have, let's do a smaller one to list all of them. What if I have only A, B, C? That corresponds to what sequences? A, B, C, A, C, B, B, A, C, B, C, A, C, A, B, and 
CVA. These are all the sequences that map to this set. Now, obviously, what I said before is that this is the same as the set B, A, C, D. Even if I write it in a different order, it's the same exact set. While clearly those are different. Right. This, this thing that sounds so clear when you see it on the board, for every problem you have, it may not be so clear. Wait a minute, are those flowers in the Bob's garden in order or out of order? How about the rings on my hand? If I swap the rings, do I change the order? Does it matter? Does it count as a new possibility? So while I know it sounds obvious when I put it this way, it's not immediately clear in a problem. You have to think about that. Order will dictate which one it is. So for a set of n things, if this set has n objects, how many sequences can I get out of it? I'm not including repeating elements yet. The elements are distinct. So n times n plus 1 over 2. n times n plus 1 over 2? Like that? Yeah. OK. So this one has 3. And this one has? So 3 plus times 4 divided by 2, 6. How about for 4? For 4, I'll get how many? 4 times? Yeah, 4 times 5. So this is 10 in here. Do we have 10 sequences of 4 elements? If I have to write them down, all of them, do I get 10? Why not? Or why yes? 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 Uh-huh, not this, this is not the one. Here's another proposal, n factorial. I'm not sure how you got this number. You have to think a little bit. I think I added them instead of multiplying. Uh-huh, yeah, one plus two plus three plus n will be yeah. n times n plus one by two. But he's got them, I think, multiplying them. Do we all know what n factorial is? This is one times two times three times four times n, let's say n minus one times n, right? multiplying them. That's the correct value. And uh, what I want to point out, this is very big, even if n is small. Like even if n is 10, 1 times 2 times 3 times up to 10, it's a big value. I think it's written somewhere here. Oh yeah, 3.6 million. <laughs> this is exact all the digits here, but this doesn't matter. This n factorial is a big number. In terms of growth, how does it grow then? Is it faster than the exponential 2 to the n or slower? Faster. faster. Right, so it's a big exponential. <coughs> we already call them big growing functions. And this one is faster, it grows faster. than the exponential 2 to the n. Or any exponential, 2 to the n, 10 to the n, you name it. The n factorial will eventually beat it. It's a big number. Now, why is this true? OK? We establish it's big. But why is it the number of sequences it's n factorial? <coughs> yes? Because if you when you create a sequence, so the first option, you have all the options in the set available for you, and for the next Which option, is how many? N. N. And the then next the next element, I have how many of Minus one options, and minus two and minus three, and you more finally get a thing. So, so let's write down his proof. Uh, let's call the number of sequences in the book, I think it's called P uh, of N, or something like that. Mathematics call it pi N, there's different notations, P of N. How many sequences, permutations, this is the number of permutations. <laughs> of n items. And we say it's this value, which is true. So what's the proof? Here's my permutation. 
how many options I have here to put the first element. I can choose any one of them, right? So how many options I have there? N options. How many options I have here? And minus one options. Why is it only at minus one? Why is it not N like before? Because I already put one, so that one I can't put anymore. How about here? How many options I have here? And minus two options. And if I go <coughs> down to the, this one, how many options I'll have here? Two. two options. By the time I get here, there's only two items left. Right? Yeah. Or wrong? <coughs> I have everything except two, so if I get here, I have to choose one of the two. And by the time I got here, how many options I have? One option only. So that's kind of a forced decision. I can't make any decision about it. It's whatever's left. Now, are those options independent like in the product group? Not quite independent the way we thought about it. You know, when I talk about independence, I talk in a statistical way, which was to say, you can choose the courses in English department and history department independent of each other. You can ask somebody to choose an English course for you and somebody else to choose a history course for you, and that's gonna work out okay. Can I actually say the same thing in here? I ask her to pick the first option, and I ask him to pick the last option, and whatever they pick, it's fine. Can I say that? Why not? It's not a comment. They might pick the same thing. So that independence, in a statistical sense, is not what's happening here. Yet the product rule still works. Because it works sequentially. For any choice I make here, I have n minus one choices which depend on the first choice. The which n minus one choices I have on the second spot is not always the same n minus one choices. If I choose here A, I'm left here with B, C, or D, three choices. If I choose here B, I'm left with A, C, or D. So the point is these choices are dependent, but the numbers are constant. Whatever you pick here, you guarantee to have n minus one options here. There are different n minus one options. It depends on what you pick, but they're definitely n minus one for every choice. And then once I pick two values, I have n minus two options depending what values I pick. As in, if I pick A and C, I'm left to B or D. If I pick B or A, B and A here, I'm left to C or D. No matter what I pick, I'm left to n minus two options. So because those numbers are constant, while they're not independent, product rule still works. For any options, you have that many options, which are different for every option you make, but nevertheless, n minus one. Then for every two choices, you now have n minus two. You can choose any one of those n minus two. They're not the same n minus two choices all the time. It depends what you pick in the first two positions, but they ne nevertheless n minus two. So you pick one of them. So then you get the product. Is this really a proof? I speak a lot, write almost nothing. How does that work? Why we can't do a formal proof here? What, we, we, what technique do we need to make a proof, like formal? We need induction. So we can write the formal proof in about three weeks, <coughs> but not today. How do we prove it by induction? What with induction, it's a base case, right? You know how they tell you write base cases before you prove the main induction step, right? That's not the right way to do it. You have to do the base cases at the end. But that's why, let's worry about the induction step. What the induction step would be here, if I really want to do it by induction? Induction step, that is, if I prove it for n, I want to prove it for n plus one. How do I write that? If p of n, this value, number of permutation is n factorial, that's in the induction what I'm assuming to be known already, then what? Yes. Um, so let's say you wanted to introduce a n plus one item. Yeah. And the number of possibilities for your uh, resulting sequences is going to be n plus one times the number of possibilities 
for all of your... Right, you're describing the proof. I'm only okay. describing the induction step. It says if you prove it for n items, you can assume that's already done. You have to prove it now for n plus 1 items. So if you know the number of sequences for n is n factorial, how do we prove now, assuming we know that, that for n plus 1, it's going to be n plus 1 factorial, which is, by the way, n plus 1 factorial is just n factorial multiplied with n, n plus 1. So here's an exercise for you guys. Forget about induction or not induction. Suppose I tell you for 10 items, it's guaranteed the number of sequences is 10 factorial. Trust me, right? I'm a professor in a university. I know what I'm saying. Trust me, that's enough. Now, can you prove it for 11 using the fact that for 10 is, is done, because Virgil said. Can you show that if any 10 items, when you do a sequence, you get 10 factorial possibilities? Why is it that for 11, there's 11 factorial possibilities? That's what's called an induction step. Assuming you know it for n, you get n plus 1. From 100, you get to 101. From 101, you get to 102, so on and so forth. And you still have those base cases that you have to deal with at some point. So that's an exercise. But so we'll get formally to it later. So because of uh, permutations, I want to uh, work on this uh, little variant of permutations. I, I want to say I have n items. Now I'm going to call them a1, a2, up to an. So that's my set of n elements. Let's say that this thing for now. We're going to worry about repetitions and stuff a little bit later. Just to get the theory going, let's say they are this thing. I want to permute them, but not all of them. I want to do the same exact thing, how many options I have, times how many options I have, times how many options I have, but I don't want to go all the way to the end. I only want a sequence or permutation of k of them. K it's not necessarily that big. If it's k is n, we already said. How do you do it? Well, it's n and minus 1. The number of permutations will be n factorial. Now, what happens if I don't want to permute all of them, just k of them, any k? As in, I don't choose the k. I'm saying I want a sequence. I want all sequences of k that's more than n. Let's call this guy p k n. I think the book calls it P K N. I forgot. No, P N K. Which one is it? P N K. All right, N K. So I'm gonna do the same like I did in here. This mechanism, but I don't want to go to the end. So how many options I have for the first guy? N. Choose the first element in the sequence. N options. How about the second one? Hmm? And minus one options, just like in there. How about the third one? And minus two options. The only thing is now this doesn't go all the way to the end. So this is the first part. First, this is the second. This is the which item is it? <coughs> kth item, because I only do k up to k. So by indexing, if I start with n in the first position, n minus 1 second position, the indexes go down one by one. These options, sorry, the indexes go up one by one. The number of options seem to be decreasing one by one. How many options would I have here? If this one decrease and they also decrease by one, why do I end up here? Yes. <coughs> I'm not sure because I think n minus k cannot be correct. How many items I have on the top? K items. How many items are on the bottom? n minus 0, n minus 1, n minus 2, n minus k. From 0 to k, how many items are on the bottom right now? So I have too many items on the bottom, right? Do you see that? Like if here, if I think of this as n minus 0, because I want to do indexing. 0, 1, 2, up to k. I have k plus 1 items, but k items, k plus 1 indices, there's a mistake here. That's not k. The number of 
items on the bottom has to be the same as the number of items on the top. So what is this? Plus one or minus one? Plus one. If that's effectively n minus k minus one like this. Right? So we, a little bit of attention is necessary here. We need to make sure everybody understands why is it this number of options? The number of options, like in here, decrease by one. Because once I pick three things, I have n minus three options, I pick a fourth item, <laughs> therefore later I'm gonna have n minus four options. <coughs> Those options are not independent, they're dependent. They depend on what you pick. But they go down by, they, they go down by one, they have the same <coughs> mechanism like in here. A formal proof needs induction for this kind of thing. Just I want to make sure we understand we have n, minus, n options here, n minus 1, n minus 2. This guy in the kth position, whatever k is, 3, 4, 5, 100, will be n minus k plus 1 options. Just because you can index the two, 1, 2, 3, 4, n minus 0, minus 1, and you have to have the same number of indices. Hands up, who's with me? So what is this? Assuming we prove it in the same way, how many options are here? P, this guy nk is going to be n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 all the way to n minus k plus 1. This times this times this and that. Again, product rule applies. There's a little variation that those choices are not independent, but there's the same count of them no matter what choices you make, so it works. Now, an, an observation here is that, let me write this down here. This is the same as n minus k minus 1. I would say this whole thing, p of n k, how we call it, <coughs> if I keep multiplying with the remaining ones, the ones that we went here all the way, but they're missing now because I stop at k, right? So I don't have the remaining tail. What is the tail if I keep adding those? If I add k, what, the next one is not k, it's what? This goes down by one, right? So the first one missing is? Is what? <coughs> if I went to build this product, this one goes up to n minus k plus one, so what's the next one I'd have to add to it? n minus k, and then the next one is? How far this needs to go? Two and down. So if I would keep multiplying them, this is my, my value, I have this number here. If I keep multiplying with all this uh, values, I get n factorial, right? Because if you look at it this way, this is the product from n and minus one and minus two. It continues all the way to one. If I multiply everything, I should get n factorial. That's what's happening here. So now what is the part that's missing? This part that I just add, what is this? If you read it from that end. N minus k factorial. Right, because it's one times two times three. That's n minus k factorial, so let's write this down here. P of nk times, we just say that's n minus k factorial is n factorial. <coughs> let's see. Do, before I answer the question, let's make sure everybody understands this. P of n minus k is nothing but the first part of this product from n to n minus k plus one. And then I said, if you keep going, you add the remaining factors, n minus k, n minus k minus one, so on and so forth, you get the whole product, which we said it's n factorial right here. We, we wrote it from right to left. Right? So what I wrote there is then, okay, from here, p and k is p and k. I group this, all these factors, because it's one times two times three, times one, so four to n minus k, I get n minus k factorial, and I know I'm supposed to get the whole product of n things, which is n factorial. So if p of nk is a notation representing the magnitude of... How many? Yeah, how many? So is there like a notation for 
the set of all sequences of n items? Like, is there That's the p of n, right? All sequences of n items. Is one of n items. <coughs> this is the count. Yeah. Right. So what's the what's the notation for like the set? The set? That's in the group theory. I think they have a sigma n. The group that has all the permutations in it, the group of permutations, sometimes called S6, yeah. something like that. I think it's a, in group theory, you hit these kind of groups very quickly. We're not concerned with that set of permutations, just with the number, how the size of that set, yeah. how many are there. Hands up who follow me up to here. This is which ones? This is from n all the way to n minus k plus 1, right? That's in here. And these ones are from where? From n minus k all the way down to one. one. So if you look at all of them, you get all items from one to n product, that's n factor. So we could write this uh, thing as p of n k is n factorial divided by n minus k factorial if we want. All right. Now, what we just described here <coughs> is something that says, effectively, so I, I want to go back of this uh, sequence structure that we use. So we're going to have a theorem, but we already did half of it. Our implicit theorem, which we did with just a count, uh, is to say, look, you can think of a sequence of n items. This is a sequence <coughs> of uh, n items, uh, say they are a1, this is a set. So this is a permutation or sequence. And I want to say, I don't want to say equal, but I'm going to say equal anyway and then change this for something else. I want to say the way to think of a sequence of n things, what we effectively did in here when we added the back, we say you can think of a sequence of how did we do it? K items and kind of like concatenated with another sequence of N minus K items. <coughs> with a small condition, right? We have this dependency issue. Can I say anyway you pick K items from set A and he picks separately N minus K items from set the same set. Can I put them together and make a permutation? No. Why not? Or why, why this can fail? <coughs> why can't I say you pick k items, you pick n minus k items from this set A, and when you put it together, you got a permutation. Where is the problem with that? Because he has to pick the items that person wanted to So the those items picked and orders might have common elements, right? That's what you mean. Yeah. Okay. So this works if those are disjoint. This is a sequence of k, this is a sequence of n minus k, and they have to be disjoint. So it doesn't work independently. I can't just send one guy, pick k items, give me k items, send another person, give me n minus k items, put them together. That's independent choices. Doesn't work like that. But if they're disjoint, is it the case that any permutation of n items, it's in fact a permutation of k and a permutation of the remaining n minus k. Is that true? Can you think of any permutation? For example, if n is 5 and k is 2, any way you write the permutation, so the set is a, b, c, d, e, right? five things. Any permutation, for example, d, c, e, b, a, the permutation, is it the case that this is, in fact, a permutation of two and the permutation of the remaining three? What's the two? D and C. And what's the remaining three? E, B, A. 
So this join here means that these n minus k <coughs> back items are exactly the remaining items after choosing first k. So these are not independent n minus k items. These are the whole set minus the k choices. How about the permutation B, Z, A, C, E? How that translates into a sequence of two and three. That's B, D, and that's A, C, E, right? So I want to say that any permutation is really a one-to-one -one mapping to a pair of a permutation of two and a permutation of three with the condition that those three have to be the remaining of those two. If you have to be the joint sets, they can have overlap. So what I want to do is the exercise of, I went from here to here, right? From any permutation, I've got the two parts. Can I go backwards? If anybody lists a, a permutation of k items and the permutation of the remaining n minus k items, can I put them together, get the permutation of the whole thing? Is that true? So this is a one-to-one -one map. Between what? Between permutations of everything versus a permutation of k. So this is a permutation of k, and this is a permutation of remaining n minus k. It's not just any n minus k. It's the ones that were not in here. How is it one to one though? Wouldn't it be one to many? Because like for example in the second one, like you have B D A C E, but it could also be D D A C E and I can map back to the No, that's my exactly my point. I'm glad you asked. D B A C E doesn't map to the same or, oh, or the first or those part. are sequences. This is, yeah. I so this thinking. maps to what? Yeah, D B A C E. Yeah. D B A C E, right? Yeah. It's not a one to many like before. Okay. These are sequences. These are sequences. So any sequence can be broken into parts, or any two parts that are disjoint can be glued together back to a sequence of permutation of the whole thing. So we already did this effectively here. We showed the count works out. This was how many things you permute k things out of n. That's p of n k. And what was this effectively? This 1 to 2 to 3 into n minus k? Or n minus k factorial. How does this correspond to this side here? This is exactly the number of permutations you can permute the <coughs> n minus k elements, right? So now let's put back that formula. The number of possibilities in here, we say it's n factorial, all the permutations. That has to be equal with, in how many ways can you permute k out of n? Who is this? This is this guy here. Right? This is the first part here is P and K. That is it. In how many ways can you pick K items and permute them? And how about this side here? In how many ways can you permute the remaining N minus K elements? N minus K factorial. So now this is a proof of this fact here without induction. This is called a combinatorial proof. We show it with this one-to-one -one map that the number of permutations have to be the product of in how many ways can you pick k in order, or pick k and permute them, and in how many ways can you permute the remaining n minus k. So that's exactly the same <coughs> equation we have in here. Now, that's part A of this theorem. What's part B? Part B is do the same thing but for sets, not in order. So how do we do the same kind of relation of sets? Now, I can think of, here's a set, A, B, C, D, E, and I have, so an N and I have a K that's smaller than N. I still have the, how many things I want to choose. And I want to say, well, this set is 
the set of choose k of them out of order. Because they set, we don't have order here, right? So this would be the first the first k. <coughs> first k. So then I get here A, B, C. And then I have the remaining. If I chose k, how many things I have left? In this case, that would be what set. If I say the, the, the chose k are always the first k of this set. This would be the remaining d e. What if I say, here's another set, uh, B, D, A, C, E. How would this work in terms of breaking the first K? In, in this example, K is 3, right? N is 5 and K is 3. How would this work? What would be the set of the choices? The choices are the front of the set. B, D, A. And this would be remaining C, E. Right? Is this a one-to-one -one map like before? Every set can be chop off casings out of it, and the remaining n minus k stay that side. Why not? Well, if the order doesn't matter, if you could just rearrange the first three and the last two. And right, right. But they are sets, so I'm not. I'm not going to list E D separately here. I'm saying I got the, the, these are different possibilities. A B C versus D E. Right? It's a different possibility versus BDA versus CE, right? But I'm asking again, is it a one to one map? Yes. No, it's not. Why Actually, not? <coughs> Why it's not? Yes. On the right, you have two sets. Two of possibilities of breaking. Yeah, there's like, so you have two options, each one having two uh, unique sets. And then on the left, both of those are. These are the same set. They're not two different things. They're the same thing. Now, this is two different splits. Saying set ABC versus DE is different than saying set BDA versus CE. That are two different things. But the first one is not. <coughs> not good. So what do I do? Yes. Of them. Choose the first K of them. First K of them as set. So without order. Yes. Is there a way to fix this? I still want to build my map here. Just I'm, you know, I got stuck because I started the wrong way. How do I fix this? I want a map that has to do with sets. I think everybody agrees with me on sequences, right? Sequences, I have no problem. I take a sequence, I can break it into parts, get two sequences exactly of size k and minus k. Now if I get two disjoint sequences, k and minus k, meaning the n minus k are the remaining one, glue it back together, I back and get the sequence. No problem there. In here, it doesn't really work. So I need a fix. Yes? You could, um, you could create the the set of all sequences that you could get. So you say so keep these as sequences. Uh, That's what he's saying. Uh, this part cannot be sets. Yeah, this sense. has to be a sequence, okay? So okay, let's make it sequences then. Sorry. <coughs> you should be prepared with an eraser here. Right? Okay, I have a sequence here. This is another sequence. I still want to take, actually when I say the word first, that would have been invalid with sets, right? What first means, if that's a set, there is no first. Now it makes sense, right? First, k, means what? Take the first k, but not as a, not as a sequence, like before. I take it as a set. So for this, I'll get what set in the front? A, B, C, and the remaining ones are gonna be D. So, clearly works this way, right? Do we all agree I can take a sequence, break it into parts? But does it work this way, the other way? 
Can I take a set A, B, C? This has to be disjoint, right? They still disjoint. But can I take the set A, B, C, and D and make back a sequence out of it? I need order, right? If I make those sequences, I'm back to part one, right? Like, I haven't seen a sequence now, so I'm back there. So I'm going to give up on going from this side back to this side. I'm going to say, OK, I'm not smart enough. Give up that part. How about I just go from left to right? Take a sequence. Right? <coughs> I know what k is. This k is always k versus n minus k. Break it into parts, k set, n minus k set. So I'm going to say only goes one way. That way. Now, I have another problem. This will go that way, but how about A, C, B, D, E? Sorry, E, D. Where would this one go? <laughs> this is a different sequence than this, right? A, C, B, D, E. Uh, the first one versus this one are different sequences. However, I think they go to the same set, right? This is the first three set. A, C, B, right? And this here goes to what? They go to E, B, right? But notice that A, C, B is the same set as A, B, C, and E, D is the same set as D. So this relationship is one to many from, from, sorry many to one. There are many sequences here that to generate exactly the same split as sets. A, C, B, A, B, C versus E, D, and D. So what I want to know is how many times I've got the same exact split. There are many sequences here. How many? In factorial. How many times I've got the same exact split left and split right? Yes. What is the factorial of the number? Of Which is how many? Uh, we know how many i's here. So it's three factorial. K factorial. K factorial. And this is? N minus K factorial. Right? The number of possibilities to get the same exact set is how many permutations are generating this set. All K factorial permutations, A, B, C, A, C, B, B, C, A, B, A, C, will generate exactly the same set, because this is out of order. And all permutations that end in E, D, D, E, which are N minus K factorial, will generate the set E, D, which is the same. So if I'm to look at this table, how many rows are in this table? I know they're N factorial rows. <coughs> but some of them are the same. So how many things are the same? How many times a row is repeated here? Like this particular row, A, B, C, D, E. How many times appears one row? Row repeated. How many times? Yes. If this repeats k factorial times, this repeats n minus k factorial times. And all possibilities are listed as permutations. Every possible set of k, set and minus k will repeat in this table that many times. So how many distinct rows I have? If every row, I know there's n factorial rows in the table, and I know each row repeats that many times, how many unique rows? It could be n factorial minus n factorial. Minus. Let's do this again. I have many rows, and each <laughs> row repeats 10 times. How many rows, different rows are there? Divided, right? If every thing is repeated 10 times, how many unique things I have in my collection? The size of the collection divided by 10, because each item has been listed 10 times, right? So the number of different or unique, if you like. Let's call it set split of k versus n minus k, right? A set 
we already know that for sequences we have a perfect one-to-one -one mapping, but as sets, we know each row is repeated that many times. This must be the number of rows, so number of rows, divided by how many times each row is repeated, <coughs> which we already said is k factorial times n minus k factorial. This is the number of repetitions on each row. Yeah, my argument here was, if you have a million rows and every row is repeated 20 times, the number of different rows, it's a million divided by 20. Okay? So now, what this means, a uh, unique split of k versus n minus k, that is the number of possibilities, if you think about, of choosing k and left on the table n minus k. Right? It's like saying, I have 120 students. In how many ways can I pick seven students and leave in the class <coughs> 113? Or I could think the other way, how many ways I can pick 113 to go out and leave in the class seven, right? A split of k versus n minus k means decide a group of k that plays fo so soccer and a group of n minus k that plays basketball. Whether you pick the n minus k and you leave the k in place, or you pick the k and you leave the n minus k in place, it's the same split. So this number here, in how many ways can you split a set into k versus n minus k? It's a very important number in combinatorics. So we'll write it down as C of n k, <coughs> number of ways to split a set of n into a set of k and a set of n minus k. Whether you choose the k or you choose the n minus k, you're doing the same thing. You're producing a split of k versus n minus k. Uh, this, of course, I'm not, I'm not going to, I don't like this notation, I'm going to call it this NK, like European notation, but if you want to write it down this way, that's perfectly fine, C of NK. It's called N choose K. So another name for it is number of ways to pick K out of N or to pick n minus k out of n. So we know this value has to be n factorial, we just proved it here, divided by k factorial, n minus k factorial. And as an exercise, you can very easily show with arithmetics that n choose k is the same as n choose n minus k, which you already know with combinatorics. We say choosing k, leaving n minus k is the same as choosing n minus k and leaving k. But you can prove it with the factorials. If I am to replace k with n minus k, this guy becomes the n minus k factorial, and n minus n minus k becomes the k factorial. So whether I choose k or n minus k, I get the same value. One more proof of this. If you're not convinced that this is the guy from here, one more proof. We already know that P of n k is permute k out of a set of n. So the way we generated this number was to say, well, you have n options here, then n minus 1 options, all the way to, so from n <coughs> options to n minus k plus 1 options. There's a product between them. That's how we got it. I'm going to get this now to say the same exact number is in fact choose. So instead of thinking how many options I have for the first item, second item, third item, that's how we got this value. By the way, we know what this is. This is n factorial divided by, what was it? n minus k factorial. Now, every one of these sequences, these are sequences here, can be obtained in a different way. 
choose k <coughs> items as a set and then permute them in all possible ways. If I do this, don't I get all the options of k sequences out of n? Instead of thinking how, how my possibilities are here, 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 there, I'm going to think in a different way. Just <coughs> choose first k as a set, and then permute them in all possibilities. That has to be the same value. So if I do that, that will be how do I choose k? I have n choose k options to choose k and then to permute them, those k items in all possible set, how many ways can I permute k items? K times k factorial. This has to be this value, right? P of n k. I just said they're the same thing. So whether we get it directly this way, or we say the number of combinations times how many times you can permute each combination is the same, gives me back all the sequences of k. So now if you look at the equation, what does that mean? It means n choose k times k factorial has to be this, n factorial divided by n minus k factorial. So now, of course, I only want n choose k out of here. n choose k has to be n factorial divided by k factorial n minus k factorial. Okay? So I just divide this k factorial, and I get the denominator that I've got here. So I now have two proofs for n choose k. One is saying, write all those rows of that table and count how many times you repeated each row. We counted was k factorial times n minus k factorial. So we divided the number of rows n factorial by the number. We got the number of combinations. <coughs> the second proof is to say, take this sequences of k out of n, which you already know we got this value, we know how many they are, and think about generating them in a different way. Instead of how many options times how many options, how many options, I'm going to say just pick k items first and then permute them in how many ways you can. Would that generate all the sequences of k out of n by first picking a set and then permute that set in how many ways you can? Would I miss any sequence if I do it this way, the second way? Would I count a sequence twice? So again, how do I do the second part? I choose first three items out of five. And then, once I choose the three items, I permute them in all possibilities of permuting three items. So I, I say that that's the same as generating any sequence of three out of five because you pick the tree and then you generate all the sequence possible with that. How many people with me? This is the kind of way that we're going to have to solve combinatorial problems. Very often we're going to have to count some, something in two ways and say the two counts are equal. That's exactly what we're doing here. <coughs> this procedure, how many ways can I pick k out of, of n? That's this n choose k. Then how many ways can I permute those k items I just chose. Well, that's k factorial. And it's the same number like before, which is n factorial divided by this. So if I want to just calculate n choose k, I further divide by k factorial, and I get my answer. That's the second proof for n choose k. Um, so let's see an example. Byte is a sequence of how many bits? Eight bits. How many bytes bytes with Y have exactly three bits one? That means they have to have exactly what? Five bits have to be? Zero, zero, because bits are only zero or one. So how many uh, 
what what counting do we need to do here? How do we count how many bytes have three ones in them? Somebody else. What does this come down to? Is it the inclusion exclusion? Is it the product or what is it? Or the does matter, but in a different way. What are our items that we pick from in here? Items are the bytes positions, bits positions, right? Bits positions. So the set is what? One, two, up to eight. What are the choices? What am I picking out of this set? No. I'm picking the positions of the one bit. <coughs> Three positions for one bit. So now it's out of order. It doesn't matter in what order you pick the tree. It only matters which tree you pick. Right? The set say, what are the possibilities to come out? If I pick the set one, three, and five, what kind of byte that is? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If I pick one, three, five, what byte that results in? One, one, zero, What if I pick two, three, and four? What byte that results in? Zero, So it doesn't matter how I pick in what order. This is the same choice as. 3, 4, 2, right? If I pick 3, 4, 2 or 2, 3, 4, I get the same bits being 1. So in that sense, the choices are out of order. I choose any 3 out of a set of 8. So how many options are there? The options is A, a choose 3, which is 8 factorial divided by 3 factorial, 5 factorial. I can do that down to a calculation, that's 56 possibilities. <coughs> what if I say, in how many ways can I pick five zero bits? Would that be the same, effectively the same question? Yeah, it would just be the... Picking the five zeros and picking the three ones are the same exact thing. Like I said, picking k living in the room n minus k, or picking n minus k and leaving k in the room is the same exact choice. I'm going to get 56 possibilities. I want to do one more uh, sophisticated example. So in most of these problems, Everything you have to make sure is you get the simple problems, you have to get the order versus out of order right. Remember that Bob digs six holes from the recitation. It all comes down to order versus not order. For, that's for the simple problems. For complicated problems, we have to figure out the line of thinking. You know, the main thinking ideas, when we get stuck, how do we get unstuck? That's true for all math. But here, for the simple problems like this, it's not like you're not going to know how to multiply a few numbers or divide few numbers. The question is, is it a combination of a set out of another set, then it's combinations, or is it a permutation of items? Do the order matter? And while the bytes or the bits order matter, right? If I arrange the bits in a different order, I get another byte. As far as I define my, my what is it? My options correctly, here's what are the set of options Here's what you do, you pick three out of those. Now it's clearly out of order. It doesn't matter which order you pick those three. So here's another thing that I want to do here. Is I want to figure out how much is x plus y times x plus y, where these are two variables, symbols. A matter for now. Who is x and who is y? I think you guys know that this is x squared plus two xy plus y squared. Right? What if I do x plus y times x plus y times x plus y? 
Again, X and Y, it doesn't matter what they are here. Elements, values, some numbers from an abelian group, it matters. Just they can be multiplied together. Well, I can do this one times X plus Y, right? So that's going to be X squared plus 2XY plus Y squared times X plus Y. So this will be X plus 3XY plus 3XY squared plus Y cubed. Missing something? Uh, I think everybody can see where the x cube is coming from. That's an x times x squared. Where's the y cube coming from? Y times y squared. How do I get 3x squared plus 1? That's a sum of two things, right? 3x squared comes from I can get 2xy times an x. So where is this guy coming from? It's a 2x y times x plus, that's two oranges, and I have another orange just like that, coming from where? From the x squared times the y. <coughs> if you think about this, they've been grouped by each term in here contains a different number of x and y in them. This is three x's, no y's. Two x's, one y. One x's and two y's and three y's. And the number in the front is how many of that kind you have. Right? There's three oranges because this comes from two oranges plus an orange, same <coughs> kind, right? Two, two x's and a y, so I sum them up as three. What happens if I do another one? I let's just call it this plus y fourth. We can just say to the fourth. So what happens when I multiply this whole thing with another x plus y. I'm going to get an x fourth, of course, because think about what happens when I do this times x plus y. x times x four cube gives me the x fourth, right? Now, what are the possibilities? I'm going to get a bunch of x three y's. Every, the, the two exponents will only sum to four. Guaranteed. So this is 4, 0. This is 3, 1, right? It's going to be a 1. How can I get an x cubed times y? I can get 3x squared y times x, right? So I get, that way I get 3 oranges. But there's another x cubed y1 coming from somewhere else. It's the who? <coughs> is the x cubed times the y, right? So how many oranges of that kind are now? Four. Four. I'm going to get a bunch of x2, y2. How many of those are there? Six. Six. I'm going to get four x, y cubed. That's because these oranges and these apples are symmetric. How many oranges come as x cubed y will be x, y cubed. The whole problem is symmetric x and y. And then I'm going to get the y four. So what happens if I do it like, you know, generic n times? It's going to be a sum of things, right? It's going to be a sum. All possibilities, every exponent will have to sum up to what? The two powers on x and y only sums up to this guy in here, right? Look at this. The 2, 2, 2, right? This is 1, 1, 2, and 2. They sum up to what's the power here? x plus y squared, right? How about in here? All the exponents, powers, sums to 3. So this guy, if x has k, the y has to have <coughs> n minus k. That's, of course, for all k's possible. From where? From 0 to n, right? Because the maximum you can have on x is what? And then you have no y's at all, like this. Or you can have all everything on y, how many is max? <coughs> n, right? And then you have nothing on x. The only question is, how many oranges of this particular kind we have in there? Right? We know it's going to be a sum of these guys. Just what we're missing is the 4, 6, 4. So, 
for x and y to the 0, what's going to be the coefficient in front of it? How many of those guys are we going to get? One. one. And why is 1? Because there's a only one way to get that. It has to be this x times this x times this x times that x. There's no other way to get the x to the n. Similarly, for x, 0, y, n, there's only one way to get that. So, but in general, this could be x, 5, y, n minus 5. In how many ways would I get the same orange? Look at this parenthesis I have. Again, this is x plus y times x plus y times x plus y times x plus y. <coughs> how many times? N times. So when you open up all these products, how many total terms you get without adding them up? You know, we group the terms together. We say if those two terms have the same form x squared, y squared, group them together so we get six of that kind. Without grouping, how many terms would I get here if I open all parentheses? If I don't group, how many terms do I get? Two times two times two times two times two. If I, if I have three parentheses, two, 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 if I open the terms, how many terms are going to be there? Eight. So total terms is two to the n. You can try that. This is very simple once you try it on paper. My question is, I want specifically the terms with k x's and how many y's? And minus k y's. Those terms will always look like x to the k, y to the n minus k. Now, in how many ways can I get this exact product? What does it have to happen to get exactly this? I have n parentheses here. <coughs> to get x to the k, y minus k, I have to multiply how many x's with how many y's? k x's and y n minus k. So now, how many options are, are, are here to pick k x's from k parentheses and the remaining parentheses to pick the y? So it comes down to k parentheses, k parentheses, x plus y, produce the x, and the remaining n minus k parentheses <coughs> produce the y meaning I pick the x from k of them and the y from n minus k of them, and that term, when I put it together, is going to be this. The question is, in how many ways can I do that? Yes? This is n choose k. n choose k, because it's the same like in there. So there are n choose k ways to pick exactly k for x and a minus k for y. So the coefficient here that we need is n choose k. It's a counting problem. How many times you get exactly xk times y minus, y's at n minus k? That comes to, in how many ways can you pick k parentheses to pick to get the x from there, and the remaining parentheses you'll have to multiply with the y. Let's go back to this one here. Why there were three x squared y? <coughs> because I have three options to pick two x's, and one y. What are the options? X, x, y. What's another option to get x squared y? X, y, x. What's another option? Y, x, x. How about here? Why there are four x cube, x, y cubes? <coughs> this is x plus y, x plus y. Plus. How do I get x times y cube? X y y y how else y x y y y y x y y y y x there's four ways to get this one how do i get six x square y square x x y y x y x y x y y x right six ways that's exactly how many ways can you choose k out of it so this has a name, right? 
What is this called? Which we just put? Also, by the way, as a, as a thing you can try, you can plug in this theorem any x and y you want. You can plug in 1, 0, minus 1, any values you want and see what happens. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs>